Good morning. I'm Kelly Boyers. For those of you who don't know, I'm Kelly Boyers with Adams Place. I'm here with Beth Bobman at Adams Place, and we're hosting our second webinar with Dr. David Schoenfeld um, today here, June 24th. There were RC, a social work CEUs uh, pending, and we'll make sure we get the attendance sheet to the board, and you'll get credit and a certificate of completion for this webinar. We want to thank you for participating. We're your local partner. We know things are changing in, our, in a dynamic state and as far as education and supporting our students. We're here for you in the long term. And we're very grateful to have David Schoenfeld, who is a developmental behavioral pediatrician, who is the director for the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. So you're our neighbor, David. We're so ha thankful that you're able to spend some time with us this morning and share with us the um, information that will help us support students coping with grief and loss. All right, well, thank you very much. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is really supporting students coping with both grief and loss. And I wanted to start by saying, even outside the context of a crisis, loss is very common in the lives of children. You'll find about 5% of children in the United States experience the death of a parent by the age of 16. And the vast majority of children, or about nine out of 10 children, experience the death of a family member and or friend by the time they complete high school. So this high prevalence of loss, though, contrasts with preparedness of classroom educators and other school staff. So a recent study by the American Federation of Teachers showed that 93% of classroom educators reported that they've never received any training in how to support grieving students. And this lack of training was their primary barrier that prevented them providing support and system. Now, although most children are going to adjust to even a major loss, it doesn't mean that they don't grieve, and it doesn't mean that grieving isn't extremely difficult for them. Bereavement has a significant and often long-term impact on learning, social and emotional development, behavior, and adjustment in children. Now, this pandemic is obviously causing a large number of deaths. But what I'd like to do is to begin by talking about how to support students who are grieving in general, even outside the context of a crisis. And then I'll turn to some of the unique challenges for supporting grieving students during the pandemic, as well as offer some free resources for addressing these unique challenges. I wanted to begin by saying that schools can actually provide a supportive environment to grieving students without requiring that their staff provide bereavement counseling. Really what they need to do is to be supportive and provide an empathic presence. So I often show a video clip. It's of an educator, she was a middle school teacher. She talked about the fact that a student was out because his mother was ill um, and had been out of school for about a week and then returned. And when, when he returned, she found out that his mother had actually died uh, during the hospitalization. And she said she gave him a hug. She felt very upset about it. She said she didn't, you know, she told the boy, I didn't know that this had happened. I'm so sorry. Um, and the boy just kind of interrupted her and said, please don't do this, you know. Um, and so she said, okay, I'm here if you need me. Um, my door's always open and everyone here in the school is available to talk with you. Just let me know if I could be of assistance. Well, he didn't ask for assistance, but about two weeks later, he stopped by after school and said he just wanted to say thank you. And she asked him what for, and he said, I just wanted to let you know thanks. And she said, okay, I, do, I don't actually know what I've done, but you're welcome. And then he just replied, you were here and I didn't have to talk about it. So she talked about the fact that, um, that sometimes kids really just want to go on with school, but they want people to be supportive, and to know what's going on in their lives and to be concerned and empathic. And the metaphor that she gave, which I thought was very appropriate, she said, it's like a dance. I take the first step forward if the student is ready and they take the next step, we continue to dance. If not, it's okay. You can just stop and listen to the music together. And I think when schools do physically reopen, that's a lot of what we're gonna be doing, is just listening to the music together, being present with them, knowing they've experienced crisis and loss, and not necessarily counseling them about it in the classroom setting, but rather being there, being there for them and being an empathic presence. So let's talk about how you do that. So the first thing is you have to acknowledge the loss. There's a common myth that talking to children about their loss is gonna upset them. But when you ask children about how they're feeling after the death of someone they care about, 
the, any distress that you see is from the loss itself, not from your question. So let's talk about then how you do support them. Well, first off, we have to recognize that, that many children and their families may not actually even notify the school when the child experiences a death. And many children and adolescents, when you see them, may not appear, obviously, to be grieving. And there are many reasons for that. One reason is that adults may communicate unwittingly that death is not something to be discussed in public. If a child talks to you know, someone in a public setting, let's say in the grocery store, about the, a young child, mentions that they've just had, uh, that they're going to be a, a big brother or a big sister, and they you know, just come up to someone in the store and say, my mommy's about to have a baby, then people continue the conversation. And the child realizes that's appropriate uh, to talk about. But when a child approaches someone in the grocery store and says, I'm going to my brother's funeral, then most people don't continue the conversation. And the child realizes that it's not appropriate to talk about that. Same thing happens at home. If they talk to their parent, um, let's say one parent has died, um, and the child, a young child, talks to the surviving parent. The surviving parent ha tells them what's happened, and then the child asks a question such as, does that mean dad's not going to be home for my birthday? And, and generally at that point, the mother will start crying. The child will often conclude that they did something wrong or naughty to upset their mother, and they'll reassure their mother and say things like, it's okay, mom. I can do everything dad did. I'll make dinner each night. We're going to be okay. And that gives some false sense of security to the, to the mother that the child isn't grieving when in fact the child isn't ready to grieve or certainly not ready to share that with his mother. I've seen the same thing happen in adolescents. I remember there was one child who experienced the death of his older sibling. Um, this child was about 16 years of age and his mother was a nurse at one of the hospitals I worked at. She took about two months off. The death happened suddenly as an accident uh, when he went swimming. And so uh, she was very overwhelmed by the death. And after two months home, she returned to work. And after several weeks, she came to speak to me. And she explained that her 16-year-old son was having trouble. He couldn't sleep well. He wasn't concentrating in school. He was feeling upset and very sad. And she said he had been doing well for about two months, but then started to show more problems. So she brought him in, and I spoke with him. And he said he, he confirmed the same thing, that he had been doing well. Um, until um, two months after the death. And I asked him why he thought things had changed. And he said he, he had no idea. Um, so I had a hypothesis. So I just said, well, sometimes it's hard to see your mother grieve. And he just looked at me and he said, if I had one more night where she cried herself to sleep on my shoulder, I was going to lose it. So this child was supporting his mother and to the extent where he could not even begin the grief process himself. So we have to realize that a lot of times children don't talk about this because they don't want to burden their parents who are grieving. But there are other reasons. Uh, very young children may actually not understand fully what's happened, or at least not know its long-term implications. When somebody dies, we lose the person that dies, um, and that's called the primary loss. But we also lose everything the person did, could have done, might have done, or should have done, even in the future. And that's referred to as secondary losses. Um, and for some children, they may not appreciate the secondary losses immediately in the same way adults would. I was talking to one dad, his wife died in a car accident, left him with two young children. And he looked at me and he said, I live in dread of the day my daughter has her first period. His daughter was about five years old. So she certainly was not living in dread of that. But I do think she'll understand the loss of her mother more and miss her more when she does have her period. But it'll be a while before she figures that out. So children don't always pick up on the longer term implications in the same way adults often do when they've experienced a loss. But children may actually understand what's going on and be overwhelmed by their feelings as a result and then decide they don't want to talk about it in school. Because if you have a conversation, even if it's with a school counselor, in a private office, the student still has to leave that room and then go back to a classroom and try and do math class or read. And they may not feel that they're able to make that transition, so they may conclude it's best just not to talk about it in school. Some children um, also um, do understand what's going on, and, and they want to just keep their feelings private. Um, there were many children, for example, in New York City schools who experienced uh, deaths of close family members on 9-11, but I had heard of some families where the children and the parents decided not to even inform the school that a death had happened, because the children said they didn't want to be one of the 9-11 kids in the school system. 
Uh, the, in addition, schools may also um, not see grieving students because children, particularly younger children, may express their grief indirect, indirectly through their behavior or through their play. There actually are many games that children play where death is a theme. Uh, one of the games that we've played, probably all of you have played with very young children that has death as a theme, starts in the second half of the first year of life when kids develop object permanence. At about two months of age, for example, we think when something is out of sight, it's literally out of mind for a two month old. So when a parent leaves the room, they don't maintain an internal mental representation of that person, so they don't miss them, and therefore they can't grieve if that person doesn't return. But once they develop object permanence, they recognize when people are missing, that are important to them, and they can at that point start to grieve. And that starts in the second half of the first year of life. And at that point, children at that developmental period in every culture in the world start playing the same game. Here in the United States, we refer to it as peekaboo. And actually in peekaboo, it's a game about loss. So what happens is the child fixes their gaze on someone, their separation as if that person has died, heightened concern and awareness, and then joy at reunion. And the child has to play it over and over again to try and cope with the feelings related to that loss. Um, some people have said it is therefore a game about death. And peekaboo, when you translate it literally from Old English, is alive or dead. And that's just one of the games that children start to play that help them try and cope with the loss, which they now start to understand can be permanent. So let's talk about then, what do you say to children? Because a lot of times I'm told that adults don't think they know exactly what to say and they're afraid they're gonna say the wrong things and make matters worse. So let me go over some well-intentioned comments that might not be the best to share with grieving students. I do wanna say this, comments that I make, they're not absolutely bad things to say, they're just things that you wanna reconsider. And it's really in the context of when you are in a, a professional in a school setting and you're supporting a grieving child. It would be very different, for example, if you were supporting your own children, or your nephew or niece, or if you were talking to other people in other settings where there is often the sense where you wanna provide mutual support. But when you're working in the school, the support you provide to the children is one directional. You're there to take care of them. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you think about some of these things in that context. So the first thing is be careful not to try to cheer up survivors. By making statements such as, I know it hurts very much right now, but I know you're gonna feel better in a short period of time. Instead, allow them to express their grief. Anything that begins with at least should probably be reconsidered. At least he's not in pain anymore, or at least you still have a sister, are ways where individuals often try and cheer up individuals who are grieving. And that doesn't help the grieving individual. It's just something that observers do because they don't like to see people in distress. So if you're there for the kid's need, let the kid express their grief. Don't encourage them to be strong or cover their emotions. Um, and feel free to express your own feelings and to demonstrate empathy. But don't say it exactly, don't say you know exactly how someone else feels. Um, you can say things like, I realize this must be extremely difficult for you, or I can only begin to imagine how painful this must be. Those are appropriate ways to demonstrate empathy. But again, saying, I know exactly what you're going through, you can't know that. You have to ask the person how they're feeling. Making things, statements such as, such as you must be angry is something you should also reconsider because you don't want to tell a person how they ought to feel. Often, I find that individuals also share their loss stories, their own personal narratives of loss. Um, and they may say, for example, both my parents died when I was your age is a, way to, is a way to try and connect with children. The problem with that is if you share your personal experience when someone is grieving, you form a comparison. And there's really only two ways that can go. Either you will say something that pales in comparison and that's insulting. Um, so for example, saying to a child um, who's just experienced the death of a grandparent, a more distant relative, both of my parents died when I was your age, can also uh, cause the child to think, well, I need to now support the teacher because their loss is worse than mine. Mm -hmm. um, if instead, you, um, I'm sorry, if you um, say something that pales in comparison, you'll insult them. So if a child says, I lost my grandparent, and you say, um, you know, I lost my dog this weekend, then that's, it's, it's considered insulting. 
The flip side is when you give an example that's actually worse, and that's when you start to shift the attention towards yourself, um, and that takes the attention away from the grieving child. So there's only really two ways it can go when you make comparisons, and both of them don't really help you support the grieving child. So it's best to be aware of the insight that you've developed from your own loss experiences, but don't necessarily share them with children in the setting. Instead, focus on the child's loss, their experience, and how they're feeling about it. What you really want to do is allow the child just to be upset while suspending your judgment, but intervene when safety and health is concerned. If the child mentions that they're thinking of hurting themselves or hurting someone else, or they're doing some unsafe behavior that places them at significant risk, involve a school mental health professional or make sure that a mental health professional in the community is involved to assess the child's actual risk and to intervene. But other than that, it's probably best not to judge whether you think it's normal or abnormal, but instead allow it to express, allow kids to express what they're feeling as they're feeling it. Now, some people are also worried that they're gonna say or do the wrong thing because they feel ill-informed about another cultural's practices related to mourning. Um, and although there are differences in cultural practices, the fundamental experience of grief is actually universal. When we recognize there's a range of ways to experience and express grief, we can explore ways to bridge cultural differences in order to help grieving children and families with their experience. So ask questions when you're unsure what would be most helpful for a family or an individual. But the reality is that assumptions may result in stereotypes that, don't, um, that actually cloud our perceptions and make us miss opportunities to be most helpful. I had the opportunity to provide some support to an Amish family um, that had a young child about kindergarten, kindergarten age that was murdered. And I did some support over the phone. And at one point I was visiting the family. And the grandmother was showing me around her house. And at one point, she, she showed me a photograph that was on the wall that had been framed of her granddaughter that had died. Um, and she explained to me that one day, her grandchildren were over and they were outside playing. And when she went to check on them, she noticed that a tourist had stopped his car and was taking photographs of her grandchildren. He was a photographer from out of state. She explained to the to this man that that was inappropriate given their cultural and religious beliefs. They considered photographs to be graven images and did not allow themselves to be photographed. And she asked the, this tourist to respect the boundaries of their religious beliefs. But the granddaughter was uh, so excited about getting the picture taken that she begged her mother to allow him to take the picture and, and said that he promised to send a copy. And she told me she felt so embarrassed by the situation, and by her granddaughter pleading over the picture, that she relented even though it was against her religious and cultural beliefs. And then she pointed to the photograph and she said, what a gift from God. Otherwise, I would never have a photograph to remember her. Now, if I had entered that interaction with this belief that the Amish don't use photographs as transitional objects to help support their grief, then I would have never given her the opportunity to tell me that's exactly what she was doing. Individuals have blended families and cultural backgrounds, and they may um, adopt um, practices which are not typical of their upbringing, and they may also uh, sometimes challenge, uh, feel challenged in their religious beliefs and opt for different mechanisms. So what you want to do is just to approach the family with an open mind and an open heart and help families identify what's important to them about their cultural practices and work with them to find solutions and compromises when realities require modifications in those cultural practices. For example, during the pandemic, it may not be safe to have family members clean or prepare the body for funeral as some cultures, gener cultures generally do. They may not be able to hold large uh, family funeral ceremonies to sit shiva or to have visitors uh, bring over food or to sit with them. So what we've been seeing instead is the use of virtual services, even virtual shiva, and there are even uh, mechanisms for coordination of meal delivery through online services. So we can find out what's most important to families and we can figure out how to come as close as possible um, when safety is a concern. Now I've reviewed uh, why you should say something, and I've given you some guidelines about what not to say. So let me talk about how you do initiate the conversation. 
So first, you want to express concern. Let students know that you've heard about their loss and you're available to, to provide support. Be genuine. Children can tell when adults are authentic in their communication. So if a child tells you that their uncle has died, don't say that you miss the man as well if you've never actually met him. What you can do is say, I'm sorry to hear that, you've, that you miss your uncle. That makes me sad to see you in distress. So you can share your own personal uh, perception of this, but make sure that it's authentic. Um, invite conversation and use simple, direct, open-ended questions. For example, you might ask just simply, how are you and your family doing? You wanna listen and observe and listen more and talk less. You can share observations about students' behavior or responses, but do so in a non-judgmental manner. For example, you can say, I've noticed you were very quiet in class. I wonder what are you thinking or how are you doing? You should limit your personal sharing as I already mentioned and draw on your personal experience, but keep the focus again on the child and their experience and offer practical advice. For example, I went over what to say and what not to say, and you might go over that with uh, classmates so that they'll know how to better respond um, to the needs of their peer who's grieving. Now, educators can talk with peers and help them learn how to become more comfortable supporting a grieving friend. Most children want to help their friends, but they often have limited experience supporting a child who's grieving. They may, as a result, make comments that appear insensitive or ask repetitive or intrusive questions about the death, um, or even tease the grieving peer. In one study of children ages 6 to 15 who experienced the death of a parent, 20% of these children were reported they had already experienced direct, raw taunting about their loss. Educators can help students develop skills to support a peer who's grieving and decrease the risk that this might occur by correcting misinformation and misunderstanding and, helping, and help students just learn how can you be supportive. Getting back to the steps to take to initiate the conversation, you can then offer reassurance without minimizing their concerns. Let students know that over time, they will likely be better able to cope with their distress and that you're gonna be there to help them through that process and then maintain contact. At first, children and adults may not accept your invitation to talk or your offers of support their questions, though, will evolve over time. So remain available, concerned, and connected. Now, when supporting grieving students, it's also helpful to identify and address certain reactions, such as their guilt. Young children tend to be very egocentric, and they often assume that they control external events through their actions and through their thoughts. They also have limited understanding of the real reasons and causes of death. In order to make sense of the death of someone close to them, Children will often elaborate explanations that rely on what we describe as magical thinking and assume that there was something they did, did not do, or should have done that would have in some way prevented the death of someone close to them. And that results in guilt related to the death. Even older children and adults often feel guilty when in fact there's no logical objective reason for them to feel responsible for a death. As I mentioned in the earlier webinar, People may assume some responsibility, at least unconsciously, because it helps them, that, helps them believe that by taking different actions than they had taken before, they may in some way be able to prevent the future deaths of others close to them that they care deeply about. And that may give them some illusion of control that will provide some temporary reassurance. But it is the illusion of control. So it doesn't actually prevent the death and it results in guilt. I remember seeing one seven-year-old boy who was very bright. Uh, he was actually in the all-male elite finishing school in the city, the top ranked academically. And his mother was a child psychologist on the medical school faculty, and the dad worked in another medical school in the city. They were really very supportive parents that had explained everything to their seven-year-old about his younger brother's death from sudden infant death syndrome or crib death. I remember he came into the first visit. He told me that his brother died of SIDS and said that stands for sudden infant death syndrome. He said they knew they didn't have a cure for that yet, didn't understand the cause, but they were doing research um, and that they were raising money to try and find the cause. Um, he then asked me to come and do an in-service to his second grade class. This kid was very well informed. Um, he also wasn't complaining about any problems. 
Um, he said he was doing well, but his parents just wanted him to get counseling to make sure that he stayed doing well. It was about a month after the death had occurred. And I remembered on the first visit, he looked at me and he said, my mother's about to have another child. And I said, yeah, she looks like she's at the end of her pregnancy. And I just asked him, what do you think about that? And he said, I think she's trying to replace my brother that died. And I asked him, can you do that? And he said, of course you can't do that. But that's what I think my parents think. So here the kid had insight into his parents' actions. I was very precocious, was having no difficulties. And I really didn't understand how it could be of help to him. But at the end of the second visit, after I had shown a film strip about what are some of the reactions that children have about a death, and he said to me he had some of those reactions for the first week or so, but they've all gone away. And he isn't having problems sleeping or eating or feeling sad. So I really didn't know what to say. So I just looked at him and just offhandedly asked, so why did your brother die? And he looked at me without pausing and said, because I went to camp that day. So here I thought with all the best explanations and really supportive parents, why did this kid still blame himself? Sid's is death of unknown cause. So he doesn't know the cause and we don't either. And when you don't know the cause, you tend to blame yourself. So children who experience the death of a family member during this pandemic are likely to question whether they've inadvertently exposed a family member to the virus in the first place, how they might have picked up on symptoms before the illness became more serious, or wondered if there was something they could have done to get help earlier on in the illness to help prevent the person from dying. This guilt continues to be an extremely common reaction with adolescents as well as adults. And for this reason, um, I, it's often helpful to reassure children and adults of their actual lack of responsibility for a death, even when you know there's no reason that they should feel that way. I remember doing a presentation for a third or fourth grade class um, on the invitation of a teacher. There wasn't a crisis or death that had occurred in the school but the teacher recognized that these students had a lot of losses in their lives. And after I gave the presentation, the, the children sent me letters. The teacher collected the letters and mailed them to me. And I still remember one of the girls' letters. She said, Dear Dr. Schoenfeld, thank you for coming to my class and talking about what happens when someone dies. Now I know it's not my fault. My father killed himself. And then she just signed it happy, she just wrote happy, val happy Valentine's Day uh, and signed her name. Now, I'm not suggesting that my presentation was sufficient to deal with the guilt that might be associated with the death by suicide of a parent, but it actually wasn't enough for her to disclose she was feeling that way. And that's the first step in dealing with that guilt. So I think it's really important we articulate to people that it's not their fault. And again, that's for children and adults. Often the guilt will still persist. And for those of you who are providing counseling to individuals, who have persistent guilt. Sometimes you can't persuade them to give up that guilt. What we can do is ask them, did you intend for this to happen? In the vast, vast majority of cases, they're gonna say, no, I didn't plan that or intend it or want it to happen. So then you can ask them, what is it gonna take for you to forgive yourself? And then your counseling and support might be to get them to the point where they forgive themselves for that guilt. Now, for those of uh, classroom educators, um, there are many other things that you can do to be uh, directly supportive to students, and one of them relates to academic accommodation. It's common for students to experience at least temporary academic challenges after the death of a family member or close friend. Quite honestly, we're going to see that um, in the vast majority of children who return to school after the pandemic because of the ongoing concerns of the crisis. So what I go over about academic accommodations is just not, it's not just restricted to grief. You'll see that in crisis situations as well. Pre-existing learning challenges often become worse when individuals have experienced a loss or a crisis, but you can also see the new onset of academic challenges. And that can be because of difficulty concentrating, and that may be due to disrupted sleep, to anxiety, to depression, a number of reasons. You may also have Children may also have difficulty learning, remembering, or applying concepts that they've learned. They may also have challenges with completing homework and other assignments. And that could be because they may have competing obligations, such as having to care for younger children, or in some situations I'm hearing teenagers going out and earning money when their parents are unemployed during the pandemic. And that can happen, obviously, if the parent who was earning money has died. 
Um, there may also be multiple time, multiple ways that the home environment is disrupted or changed. And then children, even when they do learn information, may have difficulty demonstrating, demonstrating that learning on tests. So it's important that we provide academic support proactively. You don't want to wait for students to begin demonstrating academic challenges before we offer academic support. And you certainly don't want academic challenges to lead to academic failure before we provide that assistance. Schools can actually be a source of tremendous support uh, for both grieving and traumatized students. But if the academic expectations even temporarily exceed students' capacity to learn, school actually is more likely to become an additional source of distress. So assist grieving students in identifying the level of academic work that feels appropriate and achievable. There are some helpful modifications that you can offer. For example, you might change an assignment. If a student um, is supposed to be working uh, individually on a project but has trouble concentrating, perhaps they can work with a partner rather than solo. But sometimes uh, students feel uncomfortable collaborating when they're grieving, and they may actually not want to work in a group project and may feel better off doing something alone. Students may find a formal research project that involves a lot of sustained attention um, on their own to be difficult uh, after, while they're grieving, and they might prefer a more engaging assignment, for example, an oral history project or a video. But for some children, they feel self-conscious when they're grieving about their appearance, um, and they may not actually want to speak in front of a class or on a video and might prefer a written assignment instead. The point is not that there's a particular type of assignment that works for grieving children, but rather different children in different contexts will need some accommodations. And the goal is to work with them to find what's, um, what's most workable. And that requires flexibility on the part of educators. Um, you also might want to change the focus or timing of a lesson. A literature class might choose a different book to discuss if the original one had a character that died through a means that was similar to the one a student is currently grieving. A health class on the dangers of substance abuse might be postponed or the grieving student excused if they just lost a sibling to a drug overdose. So think about what you're teaching and how it might be difficult for students. You might also want to reschedule or adapt tests for a student who's grieving. Immediately after death, students might be exempted from some testing or given modifications such as allowing the testing to occur alone in a quiet location with extra time. The scores for individual tests or assignments might be omitted or weighted less in determining final grades. You should consider five or four plans or for children already in special education modifications in their IEP. Again, the goal is for teachers to find a balance between maintaining reasonable expectations so the kids can uh, proceed to the next grade level or next school and still succeed, but balancing that by providing additional support and accommodations for grieving students to make learning uh, achievable. Another issue that educators should in particular focus on is grief triggers that might occur in the classroom setting. Grief triggers are sudden reminders of someone who died that can cause temporary but yet powerful emotional responses in children who are grieving. Since grief triggers can be anything that reminds children of the person that died, um, such as a song their mother used to sing that comes up in music class, or a country they visited on vacation with their cousin that's mentioned in social studies, a poem in class that discusses the past in passing, the friendship of siblings, or a reminder by a teacher for students to have their parents uh, do something or sign something, maybe a stark reminder for a child that their parent has died, their sibling has died, or someone else they care about. These, because they are so frequent, may actually be hard to predict, and they often catch children off guard. I, I often show a video clip, it's about a, it was a teenager who was talking about the fact that um, she experienced some grief triggers in the classroom, and I asked her for an example, and she said the other day she was in biology class, the teacher uh, was talking about blood vessels and it asked if anyone knew what an aneurysm was. So she raised her hand and explained what an aneurysm was. But then the teacher followed up with another question and asked what can happen if you have an aneurysm? So the student told me that she told the teacher in the class that if the aneurysm is in an important organ such as the brain and if it ruptures, the person can die. And then the student just looked at me and she said, you know, it's just ironic. 
teacher can say something that means so little to her, but yet it can have a profound effect on the student. And she explained that her father died from a ruptured brain aneurysm. She said the teacher didn't know that. She would have no way of knowing that it had happened several years ago. And she didn't believe that her teacher even recognized how distressing it was for her to discuss it. And I will point out, she raised her hand and offered to answer the question. I don't think she was prepared for the follow-up question about what happens. But that's a reasonable question for a teacher to ask in that setting. And then I, you know, I was interviewing the student for a presentation that I was going to be doing where I was taping her responses. And I asked her if she had had any other grief triggers she could think about. And she just looked at me and she said, oh yeah, it just happened today, right before I came here. Um, apparently she had had an exam that was very difficult in her class. And she was joking with one of her friends about how difficult it was. And the student that I was interviewing said, and then I said, you know, I'm going to have a heart attack. And her friend turned to her and said, I'm going to have a brain aneurysm and started shaking. And she looked at me and she said, my friend doesn't know that's how my dad died. She's a wonderful person. So the issue is these triggers come up all the time. You can't prevent all of them. So teachers and other school personnel can explain to children that they are likely to occur and then develop a safety plan for what to do when the triggers occur in the classroom setting so that children don't get overwhelmed and feel more in control. Some helpful responses for these triggers include providing a safe space or location where the student can go, such as going to the school social workers or counselor's room, or just going to another room, such as the library or classroom across the hall. Or they may uh, make arrangements for the child to be able to go speak to an adult when they're feeling upset and they wanna talk, or just setting procedures for the student to obtain support, such as a, a signal that doesn't draw attention to the student, it allows the student to leave the classroom discreetly to go to a safe space or seek the support. I had one teacher tell me she worked out with a student that whenever he was having a grief trigger, he just took a tissue from the box near the door and left the classroom, and they had already agreed where he would be going and when he would return. In some situations, it's helpful uh, to let the student call a parent or other family member if needed, uh, or to provide permission and encouragement to see the school social worker, counselor, nurse, or psychologist, and offering private time to talk to the teacher about thoughts, concerns, and feelings. I had one teacher tell me that um, he worked out with his student that uh, when she returned to class after her father's death, she was able to wear a hoodie to class. And whenever she was feeling particularly overwhelmed, she put the hood up. They both referred to this as having a hoodie moment. And when she was having a hoodie moment, he didn't call on her. He respected her sense uh, that she wasn't ready or accessible to engage fully in the classroom discussion at that point. And when she put the hood down, then he called on her. And he said it's better than having her grieve home alone by herself. And at least she's getting something from the curriculum. And he said, I can respect that she knows when she's ready to talk and I'll allow that to, uh, to occur. That kind of sensitivity and flexibility is really what we need to do. Now staff, um, staff can also be doing this even if you're con continuing to do some virtual lesson. I've actually taught a summer course online on a virtual academic platform for graduate students on how to support grieving students. And I've had a couple circumstances where the students have contacted me on the day of class to let me know that either a family member or a friend has died recently or as at risk of dying. Um, I, for example, one student was on their way to the hospital to visit a grandparent uh, who they thought would likely die that day. And in those situations, I've of course explained to them there's no need to participate in the class. And we can make arrangements for them to view the material online and catch up at some other point if they wish to. And in each case, actually, the students have said they wanted to be part of the class. It actually seemed relevant to them. But what we worked out was they just kept their webcam off. And that way, no one could tell if they were crying, they didn't feel observed, they could step away whenever they wanted. I wouldn't know, and neither would their classmates. Um, so we can still create that distancing, even in virtual situations. Now, staff should also work with children and their families to try and anticipate and minimize likely grief triggers. For example, if you were going to do a lesson on Father's Day, you know, for example, having the students write a poem to their father, you would probably want to introduce that with some sensitivity. And you might say to students, for example, some of you may have a father who's not alive or currently living with you. You can still do this thinking of your memories of your dad 
or even pick another man in your life that helped raise you or was an important support to you. That way we can all do the lesson. And that's enough of an introduction for children to recognize that you understand their life situation may be different. And this isn't just appropriate for kids whose parents have died, but it's appropriate if the father, for example, was never, the child never met the father and doesn't know who that person is, or that person is deployed, incarcerated, or dealing with substance use, or have moved out of state and is uh, divorced from the mother. In, in all of those situations, children may find that they need some accommodation so that they feel comfortable doing the assignment. Now, while these are just some general considerations about how to support grieving students outside of pandemic, let me talk now about some of the unique challenges of supporting grieving students during the pandemic. And I'm gonna highlight some resources from the Coalition to Support Grieving Students that specifically address these challenges. And when I am at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna end with some resources, including the coalition materials. And I'm gonna tell you where you can get the same list of these uh, challenges, as well as all the resources I'm gonna to mention to be able to address them. So don't try and write them down or keep up. I'm just gonna mention them in passing and I'll tell you where you can get more information. Now, after the death of someone close, even outside of the pandemic, children will become more concerned about their health and that of others that they care about. But in the setting of a pandemic, there's already often extreme concerns about personal health and the health of others. So the ability to reassure children that others close to them are healthy and not at significant risk of dying becomes challenging during the pandemic. Even if the initial death was not related to COVID-19 or wasn't even related to an infectious disease. So because it becomes important to help children deal with fears and concerns about the pandemic, in addition to any grief they might be experiencing from a personal loss. The COVID-19 pandemic resources webpage on the coalition website includes presentations and materials for educators, parents, and other professionals on how to talk to and support children during a pandemic. This information will help address, although it won't, elite, it won't eliminate, all anxiety related to the pandemic. And that's whether they're grieving a personal loss or just worried about the deaths they see reported in the media. Physical distancing measures, including lengthy school closures, increases social isolation that children generally experience when they're grieving. And it makes it difficult for schools to provide support using traditional means. While this is certainly true, it's also true that schools often provide meaningful support to grieving students when deaths occur during summer vacation and holiday breaks using phone, email, and the internet. And these same strategies can be used during a pandemic when school closures are required and they're outlined in the coalition materials. Many children's bereavement programs across the country are quickly adapting to the pandemic by providing virtual groups and or individual support. For example, in the Las Vegas area, Adams Place, which is hosting this session, is an excellent resource that does provide these virtual services. If you don't live in the Las Vegas area or you're looking for other resources, there is a National Bereavement Resource Guide that provides a state-by-state -state listing of bereavement programs um, and that was created by New York Life and Aluna. And you will find that link on the COVID webpage that I had talked about. Secondary losses that I already mentioned become even more of an issue during the pandemic. And after the death of a close family member or friend, as I said, they not only lose the person, but everything that person did or could have done. When you have a pandemic with physical distancing and school closures, the magnitude and importance of these secondary losses becomes even greater. Families may find significant challenges in even meeting basic needs, such as obtaining food, preparing meals, providing supervision, um, or accessing other needed resources, especially when there is only one adult in the home, uh, when there generally had been more than one. Um, and that individual is probably also grieving and feeling overwhelmed, not only by the death, but also by the pandemic. The usual outpouring of assistance, support, and companionship, normally extended by uh, extended family members, friends, neighbors, and members of the school community, at least in the immediate aftermath of the death, may simply not be present. Funerals may need to be postponed and family and friends are unable to visit. So we have a coalition module that addresses secondary losses that you can refer to. Family members may also be overwhelmed by the pandemic in addition to their own grief. Surviving adult family members not only have to deal with grief and the impact of the 
pandemic, such as worries about their own health and caring for their parents, but they also have to care for their grieving children. Extended family and friends um, who may not be able to attend um, or visit um, may still be so preoccupied with the pandemic and meeting the needs of their own family that they don't even reach out by phone or other virtual means. So the role of school professionals becomes even more important. Their knowledge of resources for meeting basic needs are often the first component of providing needed mental health services in the aftermath of an important loss. Now, some children's grief may not be related to a loss due to death itself. <clears throat> for some children who don't experience the death of someone they know, they may still have to cope with separation from loved ones. <clears throat> and they may also grieve their inability to celebrate their graduation, their birthday, or special holidays. Transitions, such as from school to college, may be particularly challenging during a pandemic. The website for the coalition has a guidance document that addresses these other types of losses, which are referred to in the field as ambiguous loss. <clears throat> There's also a module on coordinating services and supporting transitions that specifically addresses how do you support grieving students as they transition to new grades or schools. And the last thing I wanted to highlight in this area is supporting grieving students can be difficult in the best of times, and this is clearly not the best of times. This is a particularly difficult but critical time to maintain professional self-care. Some ways that school professionals can meet their self-care needs is through the community of professionals within their own school, but that requires more active effort um, when you have physical distancing and school closures. The impact may be longer than perhaps most of us are prepared to accept, so it's really important that we invest in professional self-care now. There is a module on professional self-care on the coalition website that offers some suggestions, and that's a topic that I discussed in the prior webinar in more detail. <clears throat> so let me end by just talking about some resources. And I wanted to focus on the Coalition to Support Grieving Students, which is a unique collaboration of leading professional organizations representing classroom educators, principals, assistants, superintendents, and other school administrators, and student support personnel, including school counselors, nurses, psychologists, and social workers. These professional organizations came together, thanks to the support of the New York Life uh, Foundation, and created the Coalition to Support Grieving Students. And you'll see this slide list the founding members of the coalition. Since we launched the website uh, that was developed in collaboration with professionals from these organizations, it was about six years ago, um, other groups have asked to join. Um, and some of the supporting organizational members are listed here. Coalition now has 100 members, which includes, for example, Adams Place. The coalition created a free school practitioner-oriented website, grievingstudents.org, that houses over 20 video training modules, most of which are only 10 to 15 minutes in length. The modules are grouped into six sections, each containing two to four individual video modules. And the topic categories addressed within the six sections are listed on this slide. Each of the videos is also accompanied by a handout in PDF format that summarizes the major points of the module. Let me go briefly over these six sections and other resources before I open this up to questions. So please start thinking of questions you'd like to ask. Um, there's a section on conversation and support. And the first video on talking with students includes actor simulations. And that's why the video is actually 30 minutes long because it includes four simulations using equity actors um, to act out scenarios where students are returning to school after a death of a parent and the teacher is offering support. Um, there are also is a section on advice on what not to say to a grieving child, providing support over time, and how to facilitate peer support. There is another section on developmental and cultural considerations, and another section on practical considerations, such as funeral attendance, secondary and cumulative losses, the importance of coordinating services and supporting transition, and the role of social media in supporting grieving students. There's a section on reactions and triggers, which talks about the impact on learning, guilt and shame, other reactions, and grief triggers, and a section on professional preparation and self-care. And the last section is on crisis and other special circumstances. 
This addresses bereavement in the context of the school crisis, the unique context of suicide, how to facilitate commemoration and memorialization in school settings, and how do you address students and staff or the situation of students and staff that have a potentially life-limiting condition. In addition to these video modules and the print materials, the website includes additional modules. For example, for example what are some of the unique considerations for a line of duty death for a family member in the police or military? There are guidance documents that offer practical guidelines that were developed by the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement on how to respond to the death of a student or staff, whether that be from all causes or specifically from suicide. We also have teacher training modules and family and school staff booklets that can be freely downloaded and ordered for print in print at no cost. There are also articles and online resources. One booklet I would recommend is a booklet after a loved one dies. This can be downloaded in English, Spanish, or Japanese uh, from the website, um, and you can order it in English or Spanish in hard copy free of charge, thanks to the support from the New York Life Foundation. That also includes the fact that shipping and handling is free. So while I think during the pandemic, we have to work virtually, uh, we certainly want to make sure that we download this, place this on websites, circulate it broadly uh, in electronic format, but you can also order free copies for your office when school does resume, um, or even to have just to uh, hand out or to mail to parents and other adults. And I'm gonna just end on this slide, which provides some contact information for the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement. And at this point, I'm gonna turn this back to Kelly um, and see if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat box, or we're a small enough group, you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, David. That was great information um, and very practical and supportive of everyone's role working with students. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Right. I have Ellie. Go ahead, Leomi. Doctor, when you were mentioning earlier about uh, when you broach the uh, conversation with a child, what if they, uh, you know, you show, you express concern and, and you're very genuine and, and all of that. What if they uh, just end the conversation? And if they say, I don't want to talk about it, uh, what would be your response to that if they just go into uh, and, and by the way, many children will do that. Many adults do that as well. Um, they either don't want to talk about it at that point, or they're feeling overwhelmed, or they don't necessarily want to talk about it with you at that moment, or they don't have any questions. Um, so I think what you do is what I said that teacher did. You just say, I'm here and I'm ready to talk with you when you are ready. Um, you can invite them to let you know when they ever wish to talk about it, but I would say it's also important you check back. Um, we often say to people, you know, if I can ever be of any help, my door is always open or here's my cell phone number and they don't call, you know, and they don't ask. I, I've actually been in this circumstance a number of times. I've been doing this work for over 30 years and um, there are a number of colleagues that I have, other pediatricians, for example, whose children die tragically and, you know, I'll call them up and I'll talk with them for an hour and they'll say it was, you know, extremely helpful and I'll say, well, you know, here's my cell phone number. You can call me at any point, I'll have it on day and night, whenever you'd like to talk. Um, but I have learned to then follow that up with, but I know you're not going to just call me if I say that. So I'd like to call you back next week. What about Tuesday or Wednesday? What night works best? And I actually make appointments um, and, and then follow up with them. And every time, almost, to a person, I've called up, they've said, oh, I really had this question, I'm so glad you called. And I say, but I told you to call me when you had questions. And they always say, I don't wanna bother you, I know you must be so busy. Well, we're all busy, but, um, so I do think that you check back in with kids. And I've had kids say things like, you know, the social worker asked me so many times if I, how I was doing since my friend died, that I finally realized she was serious. And I talked with her and she was helpful. So there's a certain amount where you just keep checking back. You're, you remain physically and emotionally present, but you wait for them to accept the invitation. Unless, of course, you're worried that 
there's something that's placing them in danger. You know, if they're suicidal, then you don't wait for them to accept the invitation. You, you act on that. But that's the main thing that I would say is just continue. I, you know, I had the experience during my training where I was asked to see a girl, she was a teenager. She had aplastic anemia and she was admitted to the hospital and she was a candidate. She, was, she wasn't a candidate for bone marrow transplant because she was too ill. But cognitively, she was all there. She was a very high achieving high school student who was an athlete as well. Um, but she had fungal sepsis and very low platelet counts and just kept bleeding in different ways. So she, she couldn't get the bone marrow transplant. And the physicians, you know, talked with her and she said, I just want to go home. So they thought she didn't understand she was dying. So they asked me to speak with her. And I remember on the first visit, she looked at me and she goes, I know why you're here. And I said, good, I know why I'm here too. We should both know that. That's a good thing. I'm here to support you. And I asked her, you know, what do you have? She explained what aplastic anemia was. I said, what can happen? She said, you can die from it. She, she understood what was going on. And then she looked at me and she said, I don't want you to stop. I said, I'll stop by each day, Monday through Friday to see how you're doing. And she said, I don't want you to stop by every day. You can stop by every other day. I said, okay, I'll step by. I'll, I'm gonna stop by every day. You can tell me to leave every other day, but I'm here for you every day. Um, and she looked at me and she said, and I don't want to meet alone with you. My mother's going to stay in the room. I go, okay, that's whatever you would like. And every other day she sent me away. We went through this for like a week. Every day I'd come, every other day she'd tell me to leave. And I didn't focus. I never actually talked with her about her impending death. I actually focused on helping her with her illness. So for example, she had such low platelet counts, she bled into her facial nerve. And so she couldn't close her eyes all the way. So she couldn't sleep. And she had fevers up to 104 and chills. So she couldn't relax to sleep. So I taught her some self-hypnosis skills and self-relaxation skills and helped to get her so she could get some sleep at night. And finally, after several days of turning me away, one day she just said, you can come back tomorrow. And then I came back the next day. And at one point she said, my mother can leave us alone. And I actually had to do a lot to get her her wish, which was to get home before she died. Um, and actually, her discharge was canceled. Um, and I had to speak directly with the physician about how it didn't make sense. She was going to die, and she wanted to do that at home. And when I called her at home right after she had arrived, she wanted me to know. Now, she couldn't hear because she also bled into, you know, into her eardrum, so she couldn't hear very well. But... As best she could, she wanted to communicate to me that she that I could have actually stayed in a hope in her room in the hospital overnight. She just wanted me to know I could always be there. Now, she died several hours after she got home. And that was what she had wanted. And her mother was very grateful that she achieved that. But the point is the kids will tell you when they're ready. Now I have to say, when she told me that her mother could leave. Her mother started crying because she thought she was going to start talking about her death. She didn't. She held my hand and she was silent. She just wanted me to know I could be there with her alone. She felt safe. But she never actually talked about the fact that she was dying. So the issue is we, you know, we talk about, you know, what tasks children need to achieve in order to grieve and what they're supposed to feel and how they're supposed to do it. And quite honestly, it's quite different. So what we want to do is just make kids know we're here. Make sure they know we're here for you. We'll support you. Let me know how I can be of help. And sometimes they don't accept that invitation. And that's okay also. Can you... So did you want me to go through the questions that are in the chat box? Yes, please. Okay. So there was a question about magical thinking. So when children are very young um, and they don't understand why things happen and they're very egocentric, they assume it's their thoughts, feelings, and wishes that cause actions and events in the world. And that's what we refer to as magical thinking. You know, if you tell a child to pray for the end of the pandemic, they may actually think that their thoughts and wishes are responsible. And that can lead to guilt. So you do, you, it's fine to pray for things, but you have to explain to children that you're, if it doesn't work, it's not because you're, you didn't pray well or that you weren't worthy, uh, but rather that you know, you've asked 
your God, you know, your belief in God has suggested that you ask this, but God chooses what to do. God's all knowing and makes that decision. So all we can do is convey our wishes and our desires, but that it's abstract and kids tend to be very concrete. Um, I actually had a colleague who does work in children's conceptual understanding of death. This is what her academic interest was in. And she, we were doing a presentation together and she said that um, her parent had died. Um, her dad was actually quite ill and was in hospice. And so she said at some point to her son, you know, why don't you come with us to hospice and see grandpa? Because you have such a good sense of humor, you'll make him feel better. And so the kid went and joked with his grandpa. And then shortly thereafter, within a day or two, his grandfather died. And so apparently when he was going to sleep each night, he was asking his, his dad, why did grandpa die? And so his dad kept explaining to him, well, he had cancer and this is what cancer does. But he just kept asking the question. Um, and he was asking this, not just actually he started by asking his mother because his mother was putting him, you know, tucking him in at night. And finally she said she just couldn't handle the question. You know, it was just too painful to keep talking about her dad's death. So she sent her husband in. And so the kid asked the question again, why did grandpa die? And so he tried to start to discuss it more with him. And the kid said, I tried to make him get better and it didn't work. So he had this belief that he killed his dad, his grandfather, because he didn't make him better enough. So it's just this sense of power that kids, we often encourage it in kids because it helps them so they don't feel powerless in a world where they really can't understand why well, actually, there are a lot of things I don't understand why they happen. And kids, you know, they find that very difficult. So we encourage that magical thinking. So, you know, I, I should, I will preface this by saying that I'm actually Catholic and I raised my children that way. And I love Santa Claus. But if you convince your kids that if they clean their room, some guy in the North Pole is going to know that and care about it enough that he's going to have elves make toys and bring, I mean, if the whole story is a bit far-fetched. So for those of you who may have put in the room, here's a spoiler alert, that if kids <laughs> actually do believe that if they clean their room, all of this is going to happen. And that means if they yell at their mother and their mother gets cancer two weeks later and dies from it, they're gonna think that's their fault. And I would say that's much more logical. So magical thinking is what happens when individuals are egocentric. It's a way to make sense of their world and to feel that they can predict and comprehend why things happen, but it makes them feel more powerful than they actually are. And that's not a good thing when bad things happen. So it's just another reason why you wanna reassure people of their lack of responsibility. So the next question here was about how much information would you share with the team about a student's loss? In large part, that depends on what the family desires, including the student, if they're old enough to ask. And so they need to know, quite honestly, they don't need to know details about what's happened. They just need to know enough so that they can provide the appropriate support to the student. Um, and that'll depend on the circumstance. I've actually worked with schools where there's been a staff member who's died, and I usually ask them, what would you like me to know about this so that I can provide specific advice? What's generally known to the students and the staff? Is there something else you're prepared to share with me that you think will help guide how I can explain things? But I don't actually need to know more than that. So I've worked with some very high profile um, school murders and hostage situations, and, and I actually don't ask about the details. Um, I only need to know what I need to know to do my job. Um, and sometimes, you know, schools will disclose a lot to me about the suicide that's occurred or why they think that the child was stressed beforehand so that I can provide some assistance and support. But I don't need to know a lot of details. And I would say school staff don't need to know that either. Um, they may be curious, um, but again, I would just go with what, what's really required. And it depends on uh, what the family says. Now there have been situations, um, a common situation is when a suicide occurs involving a student and the parents don't want people to think it's a suicide. And that's where there's a certain amount where you have to say, okay, look, were you trying to prevent suicide of other students? 
And it would be helpful if we were able to talk about the suicide because the kids are talking about it. And if we tell them it was an accident and they know it's not, that's gonna make it hard for, for them to disclose if they're feeling you know, suicidal ideation themselves or they know of that risk in someone else. But that's a hard conversation to have with grieving parents who may feel intensely guilty and overwhelmed. And I've actually been in schools where they've had to approach the parent during the funeral to ask permission. It's really, as you can imagine, it's really difficult. Um, so there are ways of dealing with that. Uh, we have that in our guidance document, for example, about what do you do if the family doesn't want you to say it's a suicide, but everyone thinks it is. And there are ways of handling that. For example, you can say to a class, well, um, they're still investigating the cause of the death and we don't know for sure what happened. But it sounds to me like, and I'm and talking with the family, they believe it to be a suicide or they don't know yet what happened. And then you can say, so we don't know why John died. But I know a lot of you have said you've heard about suicide and are worried about suicide. Suicide is an important cause of death. So let's just talk about that, even if we don't know whether it's related to John's death. So there are ways of messaging and handling this that are respectful of the family's desires but still get the needed support out to kids. In terms of obtaining copies of the information shared today, I know that I saw Kelly said she's gonna post it on Adam's Place website, on the Facebook page, I should say. Um, and you can also get, um, we can also provide other links. Uh, we have some of the information, not specifically this presentation on our COVID-19 website. And we are in the, we've just taped some presentations um, like this that are going to be edited and made available. And eventually we will have that on our website, I would hope within a couple of weeks, at least links to it. I think that's all I saw. Were there other questions that people had or follow-up questions that I didn't answer? Well, we want to thank you, David, and thank everyone for participating today. We'll have uh, more updates. We'll resume our virtual groups in August. So we'll have an, a new family orientation uh, that first Monday in August. But please uh, like us on Facebook if you haven't already to get immediate real-time information and, uh, in regard to what we're doing. And uh, check our website for additional resources as well. We'll make sure that all the links David has mentioned are on our Facebook and our website page. But thank you everyone for your time and attention for what you do and please take good care. Um, take care of yourselves. Use this time over the next July to refresh, re, re uh, um, vigorate your skills and, and um, we know that we'll head into fall together. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you.